All right, well, this should be interesting. I picked what appears to be the chalkboard background. Um, so this video, like all the other videos that I'll do where I'm drawing, I strongly suggest that you take notes as you're going along because you can bring those to class and they might help you with um, your in-class activities. They may help you with your homeworks, the pre-class questions, the post-class questions, uh, studying for the exam and whatnot. Anyways, hopefully they are paced in such a way that you can take notes as we're going. That's kind of the idea. Um, you may also want to go and get your resources that you might need for this, such as the PowerPoint slides that have the functional groups in them and the non-covalent interactions. Uh, but this video is about non-covalent interactions. Ooh. Non-covalent inter actions. Just exactly how it says these are all the interactions that are not covalent. It doesn't look like an L, does it? These are all the interactions that are not covalent, so that means they're transient. They don't last for very long, but if two functional groups happen to get close enough together and they attract, then this interaction will persist long enough maybe for something cool to happen like, oh, I don't know, a protein to fold. DNA to fold, and so on and so forth. So we're going to start by going over what the non-covalent interactions are and how to rank them. And to do that, we're going to make a chart. And up here, it, this chart is basically a how-to guide, how to identify the strongest non-covalent interaction between two functional groups. We will also learn how to draw these in the best orientation and proximity. All right, let's start by making our chart for identifying. So between two functional groups, the first question you want to ask yourself is, are there ions present? Do you remember what an ion is? An ion is a cation which means it has a, a full formal positive charge, and an anion has a full formal negative charge. So none, none of these dipole things, they have to have full, full charges. Okay, so that's the first question you're gonna ask yourself. Now we're gonna follow our handy chart, and I hope that this fits here, otherwise I'm gonna have to redraw this whole thing. And your options are yes or no, if it doesn't. We're gonna start by doing this, everything going to the left, um, and then moving right. So we're going to go with yes. Let's say that it does. And the next question you're going to ask yourself is um, do both functional groups, I'm going to do an FG for functional groups, do both functional groups have, or I guess are both functional groups ions? Well, we'll do it this way. I already started writing that. Okay. If the answer is yes, both functional groups do carry formal full charges, the way you have is what we call in biochemistry a salt bridge, and what you've probably heard in other chemistry classes as an ionic bond. These are between a full positive charge and a full negative charge. the answer is no, we'll move on to the next option. If, if the answer is no, um, meaning that one functional group has a formal charge and the other one does not, then you have an ion dipole. So this interaction is between a functional group that has a full charge, which could be positive or negative, 
So let's say it's between a full negative charge and a dipole has a partial. In this case, it would have to be a partial positive because, again, opposite charges attract. Your other option is you could have a full positive charge on a functional group and a dipole or partial negative. And again, on the next um, page, we'll look at how to draw each and every one of these. Okay, so this is, again, between two functional groups. You've got two functional groups that you have memorized um, their structures because that's important to this. And you're looking at them, and you have to look at them and say, okay, do both of them have ions? Yes. Um, or are there ions present? Yes. Do they both have ions? Yes. Then it's got to be a salt bridge. Um, and if only one of them has an ion and the other one has a dipole, then it's an ion-dipole, just like exactly how it sounds. Now the rest of the four of these are going to go off of this no. Okay, so no. So our two functional groups that we're looking at don't have full charges, but do they have partial um, charges or dipoles? So the next question is, are there any dipoles? And we'll start with the yeses. Yes, heck yeah. Okay, so now we're in the situation where we're looking at, um, are there any dipoles? If there are dipoles, do you have an H bond donor and acceptor? We will talk more about what this means. If the answer is yes, then it's an H bond or a hydrogen bond. H bonds means hydrogen bond. Okay. If it's no, then you just have a regular dipole-dipole interaction. Ooh, fancy. I didn't think I could do that. Hmm. Okay. Okay. So. Da, 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 da. Now we go over here to the no's. We have two functional groups. And no. There are no dipoles. There are no partial positives. Or partial negatives. And the next question you're going to ask yourself is within these functional groups is do they each have conjugated conjugated pi systems Do you remember what that means? That means that they have to have a double bond every other one. Conjugated pi system. It could be a ring. It is really fun to draw molecular structures on this thing. Oh, that turned out Katie Wonka. Dang it. Okay. Anyways, okay, yes. Let's say yes. Woohoo. Yes, they do. Yes, they both have them. Yay. Um, though we call this pi stacking. I think pi stacking is really cool. Um, most people's favorite interaction is a hydrogen bond. Mine's not pi stacking, but I would say mine is the salt bridge or the ion dipole. I like things with full formal charges. I feel like they've made a decision about what they want to be. They're not going to be partial. They're not going to be none. They're going to be full formal charge and ion and cation. But pi stacking is really cool. You probably only really hear about pi stacking in biochemistry, um, but it is an important interaction that has consequences. Um, for protein structure and DNA structure, really in DNA structure, there's a lot of pi second going on. All right, and let's say the answer is no. Uh, the answer has been no to basically everything. No, there's no ions. No, there are no dipoles, and no, there's 
both of them don't have a pie system, then what you're left with is Van der Waals. Also known as London Dispersion Forces, London Forces, or I think some people even call them London London Forces. I don't know why. Oops. I didn't mean to do that. How do I erase? Uh, is that an eraser? I don't know. I'm just going to leave it. Okay. Let's zoom back out so you can see everything again. Sorry about my little mark there. I legitimately have no idea how to get rid of that. But here we have the chart on how to determine um, the strongest interaction between two functional groups. And the most fun part about this is that this is an order from strongest to weakest. So the strongest non-covalent interaction is the salt bridge. And then second up is ion dipole, and then the hydrogen bond, and then dipole dipole. Pi stacking, oh, I successfully erased part of that, and then van der Waals. And that is how you can determine uh, between two functional groups what the strongest non-covalent interaction is, and we're going to spend a little bit of time um, for each one of them. I'm going to give you an example about how to draw them. Okay. Start, uh, we'll go in order from strongest to weakest. I'm going to go back here, so this is going to be a salt bridge. So let's say you were given two functional groups. One of them is the carboxylic acid, ilic acid, and an amino. Now for now you can use your functional group table that I gave you um, in the PowerPoint slides. Uh, you will need to memorize all of those because you will not be given that table on the, on the exam. But for now, for your homework, um, use that, use whatever charges it shows on there. The next class period or next set of videos, not not for the next this class that's coming up, but coming up later, we'll, I'll tell you how you figure out what these charges are um, based on pKa. Okay, stop talking. Start drawing. All right, the carboxylic acid is a carbonyl with an extra O that has a full negative. Sometimes I add parentheses around the charges so that you know that that's a charge and not an extra atom or a lone pair that got fun funkily drawn. And this is R, meaning R could be anything else. Um, obviously, it's going to be a carbon with something else on it. But the carboxylic acid is the carbonyl carbon plus an oxygen with a full charge coming off of it. The amino is a nitrogen with four bonds. Three of them are occupied by hydrogens. One of them is an R group and it has a positive charge. So I look at this and I see that both of these um, have full charges. Okay, so they're both ions. This is an anion. This is the cat ion. The T looks like a plus sign, so that's how I remember them. Um, an anion, a cat ion. If we follow it all the way down, um, that makes them uh, the strongest non-covalent interaction between these two is going to be a salt bridge. Oh no, I have an upset. I have an upset fluff. Okay, I think I fixed the fluff problem. Okay, so you've got your two functional groups. You've got them drawn out. You've identified that the strongest non-covalent interaction between the two of them is the salt bridge, and now you have to redraw them in the best orientation and proximity. Okay, well proximity just means they have to be close to each other. So the two atoms that are gonna interact with each other, in our case as oxygen with a negative charge and the nitrogen with a positive charge, have to be close to each other. Um, none of this drawing, these giant long dashed bonds um, and the right orientation means 
that these two atoms should not only be near each other, but oriented in a way that looks like they would be hanging out with each other, um, which they would be hanging out with each other, because they have opposite charges and therefore attract. Okay, so I start by drawing the two atoms that are hanging out with each other. Proximity right here, they're close to each other. In orientation, I'm not going to stick any other atom in between them to make it uh, look like those are the atoms that are interacting. You can put a little heart in between them if you want uh, to show that those are the two atoms that are interacting. And then draw the rest of the atoms coming off. Okay, and that's how you draw a salt bridge or an ionic bond um, in the best orientation and proximity. Next up, ion dipole. The two functional groups here are going to be, again, the amino. Okay, so the nitrogen with four bonds. Three of them are hydrogen. Full positive charge. It's a cation. And the other one, I'm going to just have it as just a, a ketone. A ketone is a carbonyl carbon with two R groups. They could be the same. They could be different. Okay, so there's a full charge here, okay, and there is a dipole here. If you don't remember how to determine if there's a dipole, maybe you want to come hang out at Just Ask or make an appointment to figure out, uh, to help you, remind you how you figure out whether there's a dipole here or not. But for right now, I'm just going to tell you there's a great electronegativity difference between the carbon and the oxygen, oxygen being more electronegative, so it gets a partial negative. And this carbon that's not shown is a partial positive. Now, when I look at these two, that means that this nitrogen with a full positive charge is going to be nearest to that oxygen with a partial negative because, again, opposite charges attract. So if I'm going to draw these in the best orientation and proximity, I'll start again with my nitrogen with a full charge, and I'm going to put my oxygen from the ketone nearby it. Uh, I can put a partial negative here. Um, don't draw a bond, a straight line in between them because there's no covalent bond in between them. You can, you can draw a little heart to represent that they like each other, but there's no actual formal bond in between them. They're not sharing electrons. Their electrostatics or their charges are attracted to each other. And then all the other atoms draw coming off. And I'll do one, two, three, four. Make that one the R. Hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. And that's how you draw an ion dipole in the best orientation and proximity. Again, ion means there's something that has a full charge, and dipole means that there's something that has a pos or a partial charge to it. Ion dipole, one of my favorites. Next up is the glorious hydrogen bond. I'm really picky about how you draw hydrogen bonds, so I would spend a lot of time reviewing this particular slide. Okay, so hydrogen bonds are just a special flavor of a dipole-dipole interaction, meaning that the two functional groups don't have formal charges. They have partial charges, uh, but there's something special about the functional groups. So we have, in the hydrogen bond land, we have what are called H-bond acceptors. Oops. Erase, erase. And then we also have donors. H-bond donors. All right. Some acceptors are nitrogen with a lone pair and 
something coming off of it, or an oxygen with a lone pair. Those are acceptors. A nitrogen with a lone pair, an oxygen with a lone pair. In chemistry, there exist a couple other hydrogen bond donors and acceptors, but in biochemistry, because we're limited to um, a small set of atoms that can exist biologically, we're going to stick with these ones. Okay, and the donors. These have the hydrogens on them, but they're very specific. Okay, it's a hydrogen attached to an oxygen. Or a hydrogen attached to a nitrogen. Okay. Notice that there's no carbon atoms here, like ever at all. Notice, notice, notice. All right, so those are our acceptors um, and our donors of so your functional group. One of them has a nitrogen or an oxygen with a lone pair, and the other one has um, a hydrogen attached to an oxygen or a hydrogen attached to a nitrogen. That's a that's a donor. So in order to have a hydrogen bond, you have to have both. One functional group has to have this, and one functional group has to have that. The hydrogen bond itself is the interaction between the lone pair and the hydrogen. However, if you notice, you have to have three atoms to define the hydrogen bond. So I'll draw it again. So let's say that um I, I got to redraw this. I'll stick with the same. All right, let's say you've got a ketone. Oops. Why does it look funny? I'm not sure where the... Oh, I picked the wrong thing. Okay, I picked a, the marker. What is that? Okay, let's say you've got a ketone again. All right, so again, this is an oxygen with a lone pair, and I'll just pick an OH. Okay, the three atoms that define the hydrogen bond are this one, one, two, and three, and those must be in a straight line when you draw them. All three of them must be in a straight line. Dr. Terrell, what does it look like if they're not in a straight line? Well, let me show you what some people do on their exam, and it makes me sad. They get two of them in a straight line, and then they kink the third one out. The line are these three atoms. Here, that's not a straight line anymore. This is bad and sad and it makes me sad. This is happy. Put your hydrogen bond in a straight line. I'm gonna take one more page to draw to give you an example. Uh, I don't remember what my colors were anymore. Let's do blue. Let's say I've got um, A uh, hydroxyl. You may have learned this as alcohol. They mean the same thing. That's an OH and an amide. Okay, this is uh, a nitrogen attached to a carbonyl, and this nitrogen has two hydrogens on it. All right, so if I take a look at this, I've actually got a lot of things. You have to decide first, um, are there any formal charges, any pluses or minuses? No, so you can't have ionic, and you can't have ion dipole. Now, if you look at these, all of these have uh, um, dipoles. There's a dipole here pointing, I'm sorry, dipole here pointing towards that oxygen. There's a dipole here pointing towards that oxygen. There's also a dipole here pointing towards that nitrogen. Um, a dipole pointing towards the nitrogen, pointing towards the nitrogen. Uh, so there's lots of dipoles going on. 
So now the question is, so both of them have dipoles. The question is, is this dipole-dipole or is it hydrogen bond? Well, if you look and see, the hydroxyl is both an acceptor because it has an oxygen with lone pairs and it's a donor because it has the OH. Okay, so the hydroxyl is both an acceptor and a donor. The amide is also an acceptor and a donor because it has nitrogen with a lone pair and oxygen with a lone pair, so that makes it an acceptor. Oh, I didn't spell that right. Uh, and it has a nitrogen to a hydrogen, which makes it a donor. So how do you draw this? Just pick one. I don't care which one. Just pick one. I'm going to erase this so I have some space. Hmm, it's fun to erase. Do, do, do. Swirl, 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 swirl. Again, my suggestion is that you pick your atoms and draw them closest to one another. So I'm going to pick this hydrogen. Straight line to my oxygen. Lone pairs to that R. Now remember, I need to have my hydrogen bond in a straight line. So I'm going to do my little dash line, and I'm going to pick the oxygen of the ketone. In order to get all three atoms in a straight line, draw all three atoms in the straight line. Okay, And then draw everything else coming off of it. And that's how you draw your hydrogen bond. All right, next up is the dipole dipole. Let's use a ketone, which is the carbonyl carbon, attached to two R groups. Could be the same, could be different and an aldehyde, aldehyde, carbonyl carbon, where one of the R groups is a hydrogen. Ooh, fancy. All right, so these both have dipoles. Okay. Pointing towards the oxygen, so they're dipole, dipole. Uh, do we have hydrogen bond acceptors? Yep. We have a hydrogen bond acceptor here, and we have a hydrogen bond acceptor here. Mm, so these are both hydrogen bond acceptors. And the question is, is either one of these a hydrogen bond donor? And the answer is no. We don't have an OH or an NH. The CH does not count. That is not a hydrogen bond. Don't do it. it makes me sad. So because there's no hydrogen bond donor and acceptor, then the best we can do is a dipole-dipole. So in this case, you want to line up, again, you've got a partial negative here, a partial positive on this carbon, partial negative, it's a little hard to draw with this pen, partial negative on the oxygen and partial positive on the carbon. So the way that I do it is you can stack them. So this partial positive is near this partial negative. Remember, we always want to get our opposite charges near each other. And that is your dipole-dipole. Cool. Next up, pie stacking. Oh, I love the pie stacking. It's incredibly hard to draw. Super, super hard to draw. So we're going to do um, our two functional groups will be Ooh, that turned out really bad. A phenyl. Phen. Whoa, 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 whoa. Phenyl and phenol. Okay. These are both conjugated pi systems, meaning they have a double bond every other one. Hopefully you're able to, to see that. And the way that you want to draw this, so 
Um, the slides have a really nice picture of what this looks like in three dimensions, or as best as we can draw in three dimensions, the pie stacking. Uh, but these conjugated ring systems, they're flat. And the pi electrons are above and below the ring itself. So this part right here, all the atoms are flat. So if you were to like take your hand and hold your hand out nice and flat and like parallel to the ground, that would be all the atoms. And then above and below your hand are where all of the electron clouds are. So do you remember these like orbital things, these pi orbitals? They stick above and below the plane. All right, and if you get two of these ring systems, one on top of another, their pi electron clouds will interact with each other. Now, this looks terrible. The way that you can draw it to make it look at least a little bit better is kind of offset them. And some of you that can draw really nicely will do a much better job of this than I do. But essentially, you can somehow make it look like these two um, ring systems are on top and bottom of each other. Um, and in class, I'll show you how I think about this because this one is the hardest one to draw. But if you've got two, two systems, um, two functional groups, and they both have conjugated ring systems, then you're going to have pi stacking. And it's these electron clouds that are above and below the plane of the atoms that attract. Trying to think of how I think about it. It's like if you had like two chocolate chip cookies and you put whipped cream on both sides of the cookies and then smushed them together, the whipped cream is the pie stacking attracting each other. I don't know. Maybe that's not right. Okay. That just sounds bad. All right. And last but not least, pick the right color. Uh, Van der Waals. You can abbreviate this V D W. All right. So Van der Waals is basically anything that's left over. No formal charges, no partial charges, no conjugated ring systems. Uh, so an example of this would be, let's say we have a methyl group, which is a carbon, and all carbons have four bonds, but a methyl group is a carbon with four hydrogens. So let's say we have one methyl and one ethyl, and this is a carbon two carbons, and again, all they have are hydrogens attached to them, which makes them hydrocarbons. And there's the electromagnetic uh, difference between the carbon and the hydrogen is essentially negligible, so there's no dipole. There's no arrow to draw here because there's really... Um, electronegativity wise, there's really not a huge difference between a carbon and a hydrogen. So no dipoles here, no formal charges here, no, no pluses and no minuses. Um, and so the best way to draw these is that these literally just, if they get near each other, there can be, um, a momentary disruption of the electrons in such a way that these two would attract, just momentary. So van der Waals is super, super weak. Um, the way, the best example that I have of van der Waals is your, your uh, what's that called? Um, your static, like, cling wrap that you use to cover food dishes and food, food bowls and stuff. When the static cling wrap clings to itself, and you pull it apart and makes that the static noise, that's a van der Waals. Super weak, um, but you can have a momentary disruption of electrons so that it attracts. Uh, but if you pull on it, right, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't stick very well. It's not a very strong interaction. So that's, that's my example um, of van der Waals of how to draw it in the best orientation. 
and proximity. Okay, so now you should be ready to do your homework. Um, hopefully you have some sort of chart that helps you identify the strongest non-covalent interaction between two functional groups and then how to draw this interaction Um, in the best orientation and proximity. And like I said, there's a PowerPoint slide that has all the functional groups that you have to have memorized. Um, there's also a video that I created where I go through and I draw them all. If you want to watch it, knock yourself out. Um, if not, just know that those functional groups, you have to have their structures memorized and their names memorized. This is part of learning the language of biochemistry. Make some flashcards, draw them out, get it done, and I'll see you in class. Bye!